What's up, Titans fans? Welcome to week number five, and welcome to our digital pregame coverage right here on 104.5 The Zone TV. As always, I'm your host, Will Bowling, getting you ready for today's kickoff between the Titans and the Jacksonville Jaguars. And we start with Blaine and Mickey in our tour around 104.5 The Zone TV this week. Luke Worsham of A to Z Sports reacts to exactly what happened last week in New York and the biggest problems the Titans face heading into week five. I'm concerned about you with the pass protection because the run game still seems to be there and very productive, but the total opposite in the pass game, granted, now the Jets, D-line, <laughs> are the real deal, but still seven sacks, and they didn't make any adjustments. I didn't see any chipping or keeping tight ends in on a regular basis at all. Yeah, there was only one thing that worked for the Titans on offense yesterday other than Derrick Henry in the ground game, and that was those outlet screen passes to Jeremy McNichols. Mm. And that's why they ran that so much. Like I had so many people on Twitter being like, well, why do they keep calling these screen passes? I'm like, because Todd Downing sees that that's the only thing that's working. And, well, you know, obviously this is where the A.J. Brown, Julio Jones thing does come into play. Because obviously if they're in there, you would expect the passing game to be infinitely more productive. But it is concerning that they weren't able to do anything other than, like, swing passes and, and, and screens to the backup running back. And, and like you said, a lot of that had to do with the pass protection, which, which Vrabel said today – the seven sacks were kind of because of everything, bad protection, not identifying uh, the coverage in a way that would uh, allow them to put themselves in a good protection scenario with the protection call. And he also said there were times that Tannehill was not getting rid of the ball soon enough. And I followed up on that and said, were there times where Tannehill wasn't stepping up when he should have or, or climbing the pocket? And Vrabel said, well, it's kind of hard to climb the pocket where when you climb forward and just run into someone else. Right. So kind of everything went wrong, really, in the passing game. Well, to add to that, though, uh, Luke, is uh, why didn't they attempt to move the pocket? I mean, you go watch, all you had to do is just watch the Jets and what they were doing and say, well, oh, man, we, we need to get outside the pocket and slow this pass rush down. Make them say, you know, slow down a little bit. Yeah, I feel like there was it, it was definitely rife for an opportunity for a, a boot or two, and we never really saw that because Derrick Henry was working. Derrick Henry's always going to work. I'm convinced that even if it was Woodside out there, that Derrick Henry would still work. <laughs> but but you know, it, with Tannehill, because Henry's working, you can run those boots, and they're going to have to respect Derrick Henry on that other side. And like you said, you move the pocket with Ryan Tannehill to the opposite action of where the play fake went, and, and maybe you get him a chance to step into a throw and, and go downfield, which they never really did yesterday. All right, now I'm going to ask you some questions uh, about the defense. We're with uh, Luke Worsham, uh, A to Z Sports, uh, and, and that is I saw no disguise in their defense to try to trick and get them to throw them one for a rookie quarterback. They just try to stray straight up. And the only weapon they really had that could beat them was Corey Davis. And they also didn't even double them. <laughs> yeah. Well, my big takeaway from the defense was the cushion that was consistently oh, given God. up. And, and I had some banter with Brable about that yeah. today. And, you know, some people are talking about, well, they ran a lot of bunch out of trips which when you run bunch, when those three receivers are all together, it is hard. You can't press all three of them. You'll, you'll get picked to death. But there were plenty of times where the Jets spread the ball out, and I'm looking at one right now, third down and three in overtime, ball at the Titans' 21-yard line. The Jets are going uh, four wide, it looks like, and Janoris Jenkins is standing 15 yards, or excuse, not 15, uh, eight yards away from the line of scrimmage on third and three. Like, Blaine as a safety, does that not just drive you insane? Oh, man, I would have been living. <laughs> I might have called timeout, and then they would have cussed me out when I got to the sideline. Like, what are you doing? I was like, uh, I don't think the guys like and, that call. And I asked Frable, because I posted something <laughs> with, with, with that picture and with other stuff about and Frable saying about a month ago that, well, we don't coach our players to, to back up in a spread – against a spread offense on third and short. And he's like, well, you know, you guys will just use anything I say to, to – um, and I'm like, okay, so what about that play? And he said, well, I'm going to tell Janoris Jenkins that he doesn't need to be 15 yards off the ball on third and three. And so I'm like, okay, that, that, that makes sense. And I don't know why this keeps happening because when you talk to the players, and Blaine, you can correct me if I'm wrong, 
But every time I've asked a player, I've asked Jenkins, I've asked Fulton, they always say, what's well, up to us on a given play, how much cushion. It's like, what's happening? Like, why are they doing this? Are they, like, unconfident? I don't know what's happening. Well, I would say sometimes uh, some players are very unaware of the actual situation. When I say this, it's third and three, and they're like, oh, they just line up. Oh, I'm lining up seven, eight yards deep. This is what I do when I play off technique. No, I think you need to challenge them or you need to change up what you're doing because it's third and three. You're going to go pitch and catch right there. Yeah, see, but some players aren't aware of the situation that's going on in the game. They play it as though they're robots because that's where they're at yeah. mentally. And, and, and there was also a play, and it, it was one of the deep shots, and it was an off-schedule place, and I'm not really sure what happened deep downfield in the secondary, but the ball snapped. It was third down and six. And Janoris Jenkins, I don't know if he saw something on tape or what, but the ball snapped, and he just immediately starts taking off toward the, the end zone. I, I, they're, they're playing scared, which is very strange, because I always thought, especially last year, that, you know, maybe they were just worried about not having talent. I mean, it's hard for, uh, what was his name, Jonathan Joseph, for example, to keep up playing press coverage. But they've got talent at corner now. Fulton's playing out of his mind. Uh, Jenkins has done okay. Uh, you've got uh, the Chris Jackson. You know, these guys aren't slow, so I don't know, I don't know what's going on there. Mm. Well, with uh, Luke uh, Worsham of A to Z Sports. Luke, you mentioned Fulton playing out of his mind. He's also playing out of position yesterday. They stuck him in the slot, <laughs> yeah. which all of us are like, this dude said last year, hey, man, I, I, you know, this is not my – I really have to learn how to do this. There's things I'm trying to learn. Then you stick him outside, and he's thriving. So Chris Jackson gets hurt. And who do they put back in the slot but Wasn't Christian Mullen. Fulton? So they mess up two positions. They move him off the position where he does well and put him in a position where he is – you know, admittedly had to really do some thinking to be there. Yeah, and Vrabel was asked about that today, and, and his answer was sort of, you know, we, we made that decision because we thought it was best for the team, you know, the, the answer you would expect him to give. And then about Molden, who played in the slot for the first two games, said, you know, we'll look to, to increase his role. I don't remember what exactly he said, but, you know, very strange because at that point you're affecting two positions. Yeah. But also, like, Fulton has been so outstanding on the perimeter. And Molden is, by his nature, a slot corner who I would think matches up fairly well with Jamison Crowder, who's more of a, a shifty guy than a downfield speed guy. And, and, and that's, that's like – there's a lot of, 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 a lot of stuff to peel after the trip to the Big Apple here. So you bring up Molden. He didn't play one snap on defense yesterday. Dylan Radens was in sweatpants. Elijah, or I'm sorry, uh, uh, Caleb Farley has now a yeah. shoulder, not the back that he got here with. This is the second year in a row where you're getting nothing from your draft class. And Luke, some jackal, I tweeted about this a couple, you know, a couple of days ago, and somebody's like, "You don't need those guys." Well, yes, you did. You could have yeah. used a tackle <laughs> yesterday, and you could have used two this cornerbacks issue, yeah. yesterday. And you, you could also, have used the fourth round wide receiver, right? Yeah, you could have used him too, but you didn't have any of those guys. So yes, you needed them yesterday, and you're going to need some of those guys to do something for the future, or eventually this team is just going to wear itself out. Yeah, and you guys got into this a little bit at the tail end of the the countdown to kickoff show yesterday. I was able to catch some of that on my way in to do the A to Z show. I, I think there was a caller that asked about John Robinson, and and you two and, and Kevin started talking about. Like, is there a disconnect between Vrabel and Robinson? And, and I don't think we have enough evidence to, to start pouncing on that and talk about people need to get fired and there needs to be some kind of realignment. Like, that, that kind of thing is nonsense. But there's certainly a pattern emerging of these guys get drafted, and option A is they're just not very good and John Robinson's not drafting good players. And option B is Vrabel doesn't like the players that he's given. I don't know what's happening but you can't deny that there is a pattern emerging here where these rookies are really not being asked to do anything. And it's also not like there's a whole lot of hope for the future in some cases. I mean, go back to the 2020 draft class. We don't need to talk about the lazy panda, but other than Fulton, who are we expecting to come in and, and do anything from that draft class? Murchison's a sub package guy. I guess you're getting something out of him, but Darrington Evans has had a really rough go of it. And then you move forward this year, 
who's the rookie that's going to help this team win games in 2021? Luke Worsham helping us out right now, talking Titans. He's with A to Z Sports. He's with us now. I'm Blaine and Mickey. <laughs> well, Luke, uh, I guess, what is worse? The Bengals lost last year or, or this Jets lost this year? And tell this me one, why. This <laughs> one. Okay, because well, I, I got asked about this all throughout the week because I was fairly confident. I kept saying, you know, Bra- I, Bra- I trust Brable. He's going to have this team ready to play against an 0-3 team. And everyone was like, well, what about the, the Bengals game last year? I just think that Bengals team was a little more talented, maybe not a whole heck of a lot more talented, but Joe Burrow, I, I think, did better in that game than we maybe expected Zach Wilson to do. But I, I think this one is worse, perhaps because of the missed opportunity, because the Titans were blessed with, after their one and one start to the season, the one win coming against a really tough Seattle team, you get the Colts with a crippled quarterback, and then you get the 0-3 Jets. And then next week you get the Jacksonville Jaguars, who I'm sure will be very focused this week because their head coach has really set a good precedent in that department. <laughs> um, but they had a chance to go f- into that Buffalo Monday night game 4-1. and one. And now at best it's going to be 3-2. and two. And I had someone tweet me yesterday and say, we're going to look back in, in week 18 and say, well, if they had just won that Jets game, then – you know, they may have been seated higher or hosted an extra playoff game. And, look, I think they're going to win the division just because there's not a whole heck of a lot of competition coming out of the AFC South. But they're going to look back on that Jets game at the end of the season. I, I think we can say that and, and, and regret what happened yesterday in the Meadowlands. That one coming from Blaine and Mickey earlier this week. And just the other day on J. Mart and Ramon, Wesley Woodyard, former Tennessee Titans linebacker, joined the show talking big picture about the culture of Mike Vrabel's team and what this Tennessee Titans team has in 2021, but talking about coming back from injuries and the specifics on how the Titans have handled that situation this year and in past years. Here's a peek inside the curtain as Wesley Woodyard and J. Mart and Ramon get you ready for Titans and Jags. The Jayon has now lost the starting gig been moved to a reserve role behind David Long Jr., mainly Wally Pipped situation, injury and business decisions. Yeah. Is sort of the the way we we have read it through. And it's great work by Buck. And you should check it out at A to Z Sports National. What would you say? I say it was this guy who who brought that question up. Yeah, he actually mentioned it to you, mentioned it to us earlier in the week. We do welcome in our friend. Like, everybody has a name on this show. Can we call him Grandpa Wes? Grandpa Wes. Grandpa Wes. Wesley Woodyard on the line with us, the Lumberjack. What's going on, Wes? Yo, call me no damn grandpa. <laughs> <laughs> call, me, call me Uncle Woodrow. That, that, that's more suited. What's up, fellas? What's up, Raymond? What's up? What's, up? Mark, what's happening? Uh, we're doing well, man. You're, you're doing well, too. Your, your Wildcats are undefeated right now. Oh. <sighs> Uh, we didn't want to start the show off like that now, did we? I know, I know. It's it's a it's a big it's a big week in Tennessee. We're not gonna talk about my cats, all right? I what? just heard that uh the the volunteers just revealed this all new black wardrobe that they're supposed to be sporting soon. So it's it's a great day in Tennessee, man. So good job, Ramon. Good job for your Wes, for your alma mater. Before we get to the <laughs> NFL side of things, real quick, though, I, I just gotta ask you because we're we're going through what y'all have been going through for the last like twenty five years. Um <laughs> But, I, <laughs> but what? Dude, I'm, go ahead, go ahead, go ahead. How, how does it honestly feel though to actually have your program like built up to this point, West, where it's like, okay, knock out a top ten, you guys in the top twenty five. What has this been like for you? Well, you know, man, when I was on campus, my last two years, we were the best team on the campus, so you know, it, it felt pretty good for me. But uh, no, nah, <laughs> man, it's it's good to see that my cats are doing what we. We've had a lot of these opportunities in the years, you know, opening up the season 3-0, and then we get to SEC play, and we piss down our legs and, and lose the opening game in SEC play. But these young guys, man, they got it together, and they understand what it takes to win. It's not just about running the ball all day, but it's about playing good defense, great, solid defense. And Coach Stoops uh, has those guys playing well, and they believe in one another. And I think they found a quarterback now, too, who's going to lead them in the tough times. And you can't just be that, that guy that wants to lead when everything is good, when everything is crystal clear. Huh. You got to get those grimy wins, and that's what my cats are doing right now. 
Wes, Jayon Brown, who, of course, you know a little bit from, from your time here, uh, he's moved to a reserve role. David Long's getting a starting gig. He's dealt with injuries and all this kind of thing. Uh, speak about just how how you feel about that, what your thoughts are on that, knowing knowing how kind of your tenure changed and your role on the team kind of changed. In a way, it is pretty similar to what we're seeing with Jayon right now. Yeah, man, it, it sucks. You know, it's a it, it's not a good day, uh, especially when you're when you're a linebacker. And 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 I know the the, the hard work that Jayon put in, all the great plays that Jayon made. Uh, you know, it, it sucks, man. That you know, coaches are, are nowadays trying to go with what they like to call a hot hand. And and to me, that's that's not always great coaching. I mean, sometimes it turns your back on leaders. But man, Jayon Jayon's a great football player. And, and it sucks that this happened in his in his uh, contract year. You know, it doesn't give him an opportunity to go out there and present himself to the uh, rest of the football league as a as a starter, as a as a well known playmaker throughout the league. And it sucks, man. And, and Jayon, to me, he was one of those quiet leaders that really never got a chance to blossom under this system, man. You know, man, I, I talked to Jayon and, and just try to keep his head up, man. He got to go out there. Not worry about what's going on, man. It's a league of of control what you can control, and just go out there. Don't worry about things, and make make plays when you get out there. You know, uh, it sucks, man, seeing Jay and I start. Of course, me, man. He was one of the reasons why I didn't I didn't sign back. Of course, in Tennessee because he was such a great player. I don't see what happened. I don't see what changed from then to now. You know, man, it, it sucks. You know, I know Jayon gives it all his best, and he deserves to be out there playing and starting. When you're watching this team uh, defensively, what do you think the biggest issue is when you're watch when you're watching the defense of the Titans, and of course they lose to the Jets in overtime on Sunday. What is it that yeah. just jumps out to you where you're just like, man, that is a serious problem that needs to be addressed? I mean, you know, I think I think one of them. You, we we just said it. You know, with the change of Jayon, it's not any surety within that that linebacker room. We gotta we gotta solidify that. We gotta continue to be leaders. You know, we gotta continue to make plays. I'm looking at the stat sheet, and anytime you see an uh, outside linebacker leading the team in tackles, that's not a good day, especially if it's not like a wheel linebacker. You know, my man Harold Landry's playing lights out right now. He led the team with seven tackles. But, you know, you want to see more stats from that inside linebacker group. So that's going to be the challenge. Me, I'm always going to be tough on my inside backers, man. So I got to see more of that leadership quality, that that playmaking ability that those guys have. And, and it's time, really, guys, like it, it's been a couple years. We got we to gotta progress. We got to make those plays. And so that's what we're waiting on as a, as a Titans fan base, as an organization. We got to see that stability within within that inside linebacker group so you know david david's a good spark player you know right Ray, rashawn uh, he makes big plays but we just got to see it more consistently and that's not what we're seeing we can't continue to see those those brain farts those lapses in defensive coverages and and, and we just got to play better as a unit in the inside and, and your leader can't always come from the secondary it can't always come from the the d lineman it has to come from that inner inner portion of your defense. It has to be a solidified linebacker in there that's calling plays, that's leading the charge. And to me, I thought personally Jayon gave the Titans the best the best opportunity to do that. So so what about the coaching side of it? Um because there's look, you got Jim Schwartz that's kind of there. You got Shane Bowen that's now got the title. You've got Vrabel that is a defensive minded guy. Like what? What culpability or, or what on the coaching side of things seems to be a little bit awry right now, if anything? Uh, well, you know, for me, I think it's accountability. You know, I, I hear a lot in the press conferences that we got we have to play better. We have to play better. We we we're there. We just have to play better. Well, throughout the week, you got to challenge the guys better. You got we got to be better coaches. It's not just the players. You know, it, it could be sometimes the play calling. If I know that I have a a predominantly strong defense that's good at playing zone, I'm not going to call man coverage the whole game or or vice versa. If I know that I have a, a good blitzing inside linebacker, I'm not going to sit back and allow him to play cover two down the middle of the field. I'm going to use their strength. So let's let's continue to coach better. Let's use the strength of our players. Let's put them in a position to continue to make those plays. But at the same time, if we're going to compete and hang our hat on that, then we got to see that throughout the week. So at the same time, the players, of course, you got to play better. That's in every game. But at the same time, we need to see a little bit of accountability on both sides. 
One thing that the uh, we got listeners right now, we're joined by Wesley Woolyard, the Lumberjack, former Tennessee Titan. Um, the, 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 the thing that keeps being brought up right now is the secondary. What's to come from that? Like, we see an all-pro, Pro Bowl guy, Kevin Byer, and as of late, the last couple of years, I don't know if he's doing too much for other guys or just trying to figure out what's next for this group, but do you see this as something that needs to be moved forward? Because this is one thing that continues to keep popping up in our chat right now, Wes, since you're a former yeah. defensive player from this team. Man, continuity is key. Whenever you switch around a room or a DB room, like the guys that KB played with, he played with those guys for seasons. So it's a lot of things that, okay, I used to play with a great safety by the name of Brian Dawkins. And we mm-hmm. had a guy named Ronaldo Hill. They played together for a couple years. But l- literally all they had to do, of course they were great veterans. They understood the game of football. All they had to do was sit here and make a communication with a guy non-verbally, just with eye contact, with a hand signal, just being able to understand what my guys are going to do. So KB is struggling a, a little bit in that. I'm sure he is. It's, he no longer has a Logan Ryan. He no longer has a Kenny Vaccaro. He no longer has a, a Malcolm Butler where he's, ha- he's telling him every play where to line up. So I think, man, that continuity is key. You can't it's hard to lead a bunch of group of guys who really haven't uh, – I wouldn't say they haven't bought into it, but who don't understand the, what it takes to be a winning secondary. And I think KB is struggling with that. He has a, a bunch of young group of guys that want to go out there and, and prove the game on their own shoulders, doing things that they shouldn't be doing. And, and KB is one of those guys that he will try to make those big plays. And, and he just has to understand, man, it's that time of year. It's in that season. I see what's going on, man. Just let me take care of myself and continue to make the plays that I've made in the past. And, and, and just get in the right spot, KB. Don't try to do too much. Just go out there and make your plays, set guys up in, in the defense, and just continue to try to be a leader out there. It's tough, man. Whenever you got a new group, it's it's new different leadership skills and new different communication skills that, that most people don't think about that you have to learn and have to, you know, do every day when you're out there on the field. Yeah. Um, the other part, too, Wes, is, is something that I feel like the fan base is a little fed up with. You know, it's a trend. And I told you, like, man, I, I might ask you this, but we're here now. The idea of dropping games to lesser opponents. Now, I know it's the NFL, and we had somebody from Steve Palazzolo of PFF earlier. It was like, man, it's any given Sunday. But you know, like I know, in, in games, yeah. you're supposed to win them. You better win them if you want to be that type of team, Wes. What is the idea behind that? Because I know this for sure. The reaction from the fan base is they're tired of losing these type of games, mm-hmm. i.e. to the Jets, a, a, a rookie quarterback. Or Joe Burrow last Joe year Burrow. or that Buffalo game a few years. It seems like under Vrabel they yeah. do have a tendency to play way down to bad teams. So what's with that? What was the idea in the locker room, Wes, if it happened during your team? You know, or what are the guys telling you after these type of losses? Yeah, well, first off, I'm going to say to the fan base, pump your brakes, slow down. It's not the end of the world. It's not the end of the season. Stuff like this happens. It shouldn't happen. But I, I'll say this. There's one thing that, you know, Mike did teach me is that there, this league is an 8-8 eight and eight league. Everybody can beat everybody. Any given Sunday, your team goes down. You look, at, you look at the plays. We ran 93 plays versus 60 plays. That right there, you should have dominated that game. It's, and it's like, how do we keep the ball for 40-some minutes and, and not win? and lose to a team that we circled on our calendar as a for-sure win. But when you don't do things like score in the red zone, lead in turnovers, or have uh, almost 100 yards in penalty to a young team, a young team that's trying to get their first victory, you're going to lose that game. And at the same thing, to me, like you said, inside that locker room, it, it questions, it makes the fans question, like, where's our leader? Who's leading this charge? Welcome back in. Digital pregame coverage underway here on 104.5 The Zone. We'll bowling back with you as we transition to the install with Greg Cosell. Buck Rising and Greg Cosell talk every Wednesday about the headlines around the NFL, a quick preview of the upcoming week, but also specifically focusing on how the Titans are either winning or losing. And in New York, Greg Cosell gives two big reasons why the offense isn't quite clicking yet and how they fix that heading into Jacksonville. Greg, I mean, with with the Titans right now, they have myriad injuries. They are without their top two wide receivers, even though as we tape this on Wednesday, A.J. Brown did return to practice, and we will await the injury report to see whether he was a full or limited participant. 
Um, but let's start with the offensive side of the ball. They could not pass protect. They could not generate separation uh, with the wide receivers that were available. And the New York Jets went in there and smacked them around. But I want to take a look at th- those three red zone series that the Titans had on their first three offensive drives where they won in 21 and they came away with nine, having to settle for field goals against the NFL's top red zone defense. What did you see from the Jets on Sunday? Well, I think when you look at those kinds of things, you have to look at individual plays. It's easy to look at the result, Buck, and say, gee, they had red zone issues. But, for instance, on the first possession, on first and 10, when they got to the red zone, they called what a lot of teams would call. They called a fade to the boundary X receiver, okay? A lot of teams call that, particularly when your boundary X receiver is six feet three. Mm-hmm. It was a beautifully thrown ball. It was a tough catch, and Reynolds has to make that catch. So, you know, you can't look at a play like that and say, oh, boy, they've got red zone issues. Um, now, obviously, there was a sack then to end that possession, I personally believe, watching the tape, I think that Williams, who was the sacker, I think that he actually had McNichols in coverage and made a mistake and just saw a lane open up and said, you know what, I'm going for it. And he did, and there was no one there to account for him because McNichols free release to that side. So that play ended that first possession. So then you have to start looking at at the next possession. Um, I, there was a red zone sack that ended that possession as well, and um, I thought it was uh, it was a function of the Jets doing a really good job defending the three man route concept to the wide side of the field and the ET stunt, meaning the end goes first and the tackle loops around, and the ET stunt broke down Lawan, who worked too far inside with the end, and he allowed. Williams, the looper, a direct path to Tannehill, who then had to move, and Franklin Myers cleaned it up. So that was a specific play there. Then they tried the same on the third red zone possession. They tried the same boundary X one-on-one situation. This time they did it with um, with Batson, who, uh, again, he's a smaller receiver, so you would not necessarily think of him as someone that you you would probably want to match up one-on-one on the outside um they did it against hall the corner who's much bigger that was a back shoulder throw and that was incomplete so you know it's it's and they, there were some runs mixed in there which you know they're going to do right. i mean so you, there's no reason to discuss those of course they're going to give the ball to derrick henry th- th- that's not a bad play call to give the ball to derrick henry they've only given it to him 96 times in the last three games so it's uh, not really a bad play call at this point so you know, I've always believed with, with those kinds of situations, Buck, you have to look at individual plays. It's like when people say he throws too many interceptions about a quarterback. Well, you have to look at each interception as an individual entity and see why it occurred. A number on a page doesn't tell me anything. Just like 9 versus 21, sure, that's not what you want, but just the num- those two numbers on a page uh, or on a computer, they don't tell me anything. Yeah, I'm mean, Greg, you're asking people to have nuance, and you know that that is not something that we are capable as a sports fan society of being able to do on a regular basis, particularly when the local team loses to a team that was at the time winless. But if you've been paying attention to the New York Jets at all, you know that they were not losing because their defense has been an issue. Well, one other point I'd make, there were obviously seven sacks. Five of them came on third down. Yeah. Um, a couple of those sacks were on Tannehill, not on the offensive line, where the ball, he had a throw within the timing and structure of the play design. And for whatever reason, only he can answer this. I can't answer it, but he can. And he he just didn't turn it loose. Um, and then then he would get, he got sacked. Because keep this in mind, when you call quick game throws, meaning three-step drop timing, even if it's from the gun, the t- timing of of drops and routes is still three step, five stop, five step, seven step. It just maps out a little differently because the quarterback's in the gun, but the timing is still the same. So if you have a three step timing throw, that's not a, a full field read. That's right. not hey, let's look here, then come back here. No, that's not the the design of that kind of play. So the ball has to come out, yeah, and yeah. I think there were two of them in which the ball should have come out. And if the ball doesn't come out because it's not a read per se, the quarterback gets stuck and he got stuck twice, if I'm not mistaken. 
Yeah, no, they're, you're spot on. And that's, that was actually the, uh, the, I got, for some reason, I have an odd amount of Dolphins fans in my life. And they were texting me about Ryan Tannehill that that looked very much like a Ryan Tannehill Dolphins performance of old. Of course, much different situations. Right. But something that, something that's been coming up as of late, Mike Vrabel and Ryan Tannehill after the game spoke to that. Uh, effect as well. He he's he has he at least understands that some of the problems were on him, but why he why he went through it the way that he did, uh, he wasn't able to necessarily well, discern or wasn't going to tell us. Sure, and and again, there's always little things and tweaks and things that coaches know that that I I don't know. You yeah. know, if you're not in the room in the meeting rooms, if you're not there, you don't know all the little things. I mean, I I sit and watch the tape. And I probably know a decent amount here, but I certainly don't know what they're discussing in the meeting rooms. Um, but right now, there's two main issues with their offense, and, and they're, they're really important. They can't generate any explosive plays in the pass game. I mean, they had one 20-yard completion to a, a wide receiver, and that came this week on third and 21. Yeah. So it really wasn't that big a, a play, relatively speaking. And the second point is, They're struggling to score in the red zone, which we just spoke about. So when you put those two things together, it's really difficult. I mean, right now they're a condensed offense built solely on the running of Henry, who's averaging 32 carries a game in the last three games. That's that's a tough deal in the in today's NFL, Buck. That's a tough deal. And this is no knock on Henry. He's a great, great bat. But that's just a tough uh, it's a tough way to go. Oh, and the Jets had no issue going at Derrick Henry throughout the course of that game. They were some of the most. Quincy Williams was giving him the business on a regular basis, and that that secondary was pretty adept at tackling him before he kind of broke loose in the second level. I, I forget number forty's name escapes me, but I thought he saved he saved a touchdown in that game. Gavin Gidry. Yes, he was. At, he made an incredible play to keep Derrick Henry from doing Derrick Henry things as that game wore on. And on the other side, they keep giving up explosive plays, Greg. they got nine plays that have gone for 30-plus yards throughout the course of these four games. So their their issues are multifold right now, and they could yeah, use some of Yeah, this was an odd talent. game. You know, it, it's funny because uh, Zach Wilson had two big plays. Uh, he had the 54-yarder on third and six late in the third quarter to call, mm-hmm. which, again, it was a second reaction movement throw. Um, it was a big-time play by Wilson. Then, of course, the 53-yard touchdown to our old friend Corey Davis um, was another um, play where uh, another secondary action play that just showed the confidence and throwing ability of Wilson. Those plays, to me, are really hard to speak about in terms of, you know, problems. I mean, obviously, they count, and that's 107 yards worth of of play, and one of them's a touchdown, Um, but... You know, those are to me, those are not issues with the structure of your defense per se. I mean, those are those were just big time plays by a quarterback that's capable of making those kinds of plays. Yeah, I think that the only reason that fans are frustrated is because they haven't seen Zach Wilson to do too much of that until such right. time. Right. And, and by the way, the Tennessee Titans. And it's funny you say that because in all honesty, other the note I made about Wilson after I watched the tape of the game was he made a few outstanding throws slash plays in this game, but he still had issues with ball placement. He missed too many throws. He must make routinely. So, you know, he, he, he would, those plays were big, obviously. Mm-hmm. And, and by the way, plays like that become magnified when your offense doesn't score, uh, which the Tennessee offense is struggling to do. But I didn't think Wilson overall had a big time game. Um, so, you know, we'll, we'll see going forward. Yeah, certainly. Let, let's kind of stay there with the rookie quarterbacks right now, Greg, because we, we I think we've talked about Wilson enough unless there's some more observations that you'd like to get to. But going back to Thursday night football between the Jags and the Bengals, Jags obviously, you know, blew a, a, a 14 nothing halftime lead, probably should have been 21 with just a little bit extra push from Trevor Lawrence on that carry on fourth down where they had the turnover on downs, but he played mistake-free football, no turnovers. It was probably as clean a performance as we've seen from him thus far. And it seemed like uh, the offensive coordinator in Jacksonville was finding ways to utilize his legs as a means to move the offense. James Robinson was a big part of that as well. What did you kind of see from the Jags and particularly the young quarterback that allowed him to, to flourish a little more than we've seen lately? 
Yeah, and I understand they're they're just trying to win a game and they're trying to do anything they can to win. But I'd be careful about those running plays with Lawrence. He's That's exactly he's what of, I thought. He's kind of a stock like build guy. He's he's not you know if he starts running and trying to take on guys with his shoulders, he's going to have a little bit of an issue going forward. Um, but I think he's going through the learning phase of throwing with timing and anticipation and innately understanding what open means in the NFL. Um, I thought though that this game he looked more comfortable overall my sense watching the tape was that he showed incremental but clear improvement even some completions he's still just a beat late i think that'll come um so the question is we'll see if he can build on it now keep one thing in mind it was the first game that they had a functional and volume run game with james robinson and that's also a factor you know, I don't know if you saw this statement by Brandon Staley after the game. It wasn't, I don't know if it was after the game or the next day about the value of run games. And if you haven't seen it, I'm not going to sit here and recite it, but needless to say, he talks about how valuable the run game is. You should go, and, and people listening should go find that statement because everybody now speaks about the NFL as if the run game is irrelevant and doesn't matter. I'll and see if our... Could- I'll see if our producer Will Bowling can put this in uh, as a as a part of the a part of the podcast because I be have great. seen the clip and I think it's very much worth for the audience to hear as a part yeah, of this I conversation. Mean, yeah, and I think it's really important. And so my point being, getting back to Lawrence, and hopefully uh, you can find that and and people can hear it, um, is you know when you have a functional and volume run game that really helps in many different ways and. Uh, so that was the first game this year where that was the case. So we'll see if they can, if Lawrence can continue to build on his incremental improvement and we'll see also Buck, if they can continue to have a run game that has, that has value. One final segment here on our digital pregame coverage as we get you ready for Titans and Jaguars. Buck rising will take over the countdown to kickoff coming up here at the top of the hour. But first we finish things off with the three HL crew talking this week about Titans and Jaguars and discussing with Buck rising about how this team gets back on track and how it assesses its main weaknesses coming out of New York. Another new rookie quarterback. The Titans are going to see this Sunday. Here's Buck rising's chat with three HL. In the case of Bud Dupree, uh, you know, this is the savior of the pass rush, right? So uh, he did what so many other professional athletes, have done in their lives, which is come back too soon. And now, you know, before uh, before the Colts game in week three, before Bud Dupree dressed out, was active, but didn't play a snap, and, and it was because he was there in an emergency use basis only. And then the following week, uh, this Sunday against New York, he's just straight inactive. What Mike Vrabel had said leading into the Colts week was, yeah, we're still trying to figure out how to manage this on a day-by-day basis um, and whether – that whether he's ready for this in so many words. And it turns out that he's physically not ready for that kind of workload. So for all the scrutiny that Taylor Lewan is getting for basically the same issue, Bud Dupree is dealing with the exact same thing on the other side of the ball because it only makes the most sense in the world, and we've seen this a million times. And whether you can only tell your coach, yeah, coach, I'm ready to go, and your medical staff says, yeah, he's physically able to play in the football game. Well, if you're the coach – all right, go get him, Tiger. Let's see what it looks like. And then it ends up being five sacks by Chandler Jones and not that many pressures by Bud Dupree through four games and only two that he's played in. Yeah, and that's why, to me, that's why I asked a week ago, who is it falling on? I think I tweeted in the Titans tonight. Who is it falling on that guys are able to get, guys are able to get back out there? Like, you have to a, – a great franchise, all program, has to protect – the investment. Like, if you mm-hmm. ask a player, if they're in the locker room every day getting treatment, like, that's why I'm not opposed to guys getting treatment and rehab elsewhere because if you're in the if you're in the training room every day when guys come into their practice, unconsciously, the guys that are your teammates are going to ask you, hey, man, how you feeling, dog, when you coming back? Yeah. All of that wears on you. Then you got the coaches coming in. Then you got management coming in. Then the ownership's trickling down to management. Then you all of a sudden got the, the fans chiming in. Dude, that's a lot of pressure. And plus... You got competitive spirit. You want to be out You want to be out there. Yeah. So it's like, yeah. oh, man, you got it. Like, coming back from ACL, and this is college on a lesser degree, but I wanted to get out there after five weeks. I mean, after five months. I, I got released early, but 
I wanted to go. They were still like, dude, you released, but you don't need to go yet. Right. So you need yeah. a system that protects you yeah, from you. Yeah, you got to, man. You got to have somebody you trust in and believe in. And that's why I said then, a week ago, who does this fall on? Is the tri Titans training staff doing their job or is it the coaches? Somebody got to be able to pull the plug. Somebody has and, to. And, well, that's what they did. Play. He's not playing. Right. I, I agree. Plug. I agree. But I, I, don't, yeah. I don't believe it should have got to that point. Honestly. And, you know, I mean, that's, listen, that's, that's something that, and I, I don't think you're wrong. I don't, I think you speak for plenty of people, but it's also, that's just such a, it's such a, it's such an easy way to do the analysis in retrospect. Yeah, you know 2020, yeah, hindsight, yeah, without question. Yep, I get it. Yeah, I mean, so mm -hmm. this is, this is what we do in yep. sports media. We are professional yep. second guessers. It's why I thrive because this is what I live to do. Well, I'm new to it, Buck. But, I don't really know what I'm doing. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, I mean, I just kind of look right. at it and say, oh, okay, whether it was a good idea right. or not, in those first two weeks, well, they've since adapted that plan in the second two weeks, and now the focus is on longevity, and you look at a, you look at a damn injury report that has 21 <laughs> players on it in total and a lot more full participants today than there were yesterday, and you realize, okay, they're slow playing everybody at this point because they're as scared as the fans are that this thing is a house of cards and they're one injury at one position of importance away from not being a competitive football team and losing by three points in overtime to the damn New York Jets. So, like, all of it is being done in real time in front of us. It's just, you know, how much you want to overreact to what's happening in real time. Kickoff is just around the corner, but... Coming up in a couple of minutes, Buck Rising will take over on 104.5 The Zone. Titans Radio will take you through week five. It's another Sunday in the NFL. It's time to get back in the win column. We'll talk to you next week. Enjoy the show. And go Titans.